thanks for coming to our program here um, on litigating criminal and civil trade secrets, as well as uh, we'll actually have an angle about insurance issues that arise in trade secret cases. Uh, so just by way of a quick introduction, my name is Eugene Marr. Uh, I actually litigate IP cases, primarily trade secret and patent cases in the civil side. Uh, and I'm a member, as uh, Greg introduced, of our firm's new technology industry group. And I'll turn it over from my uh, co-presenters to introduce themselves as well. Hi there, I'm Jessica Nall. I'm the uh, chair of the White Collar Defense and Investigations Group at Varela. I was previously the chair of this um, awesome event, the whole MCLE Day, for the last two years. So this is the third year. Uh, that I'm participating, and I'm doing it in place of my wonderful colleague, Janice Riker, uh, who would have presented today except for his opening statements in our big antitrust trial this morning. Uh, so I hope uh, that someday you'll all get to meet her and, and see uh, what a fabulous lawyer she is. Hi, my name's Ray Sheen. I'm a partner in the Insurance Recovery Group uh, here at Forella. I uh, work with clients um, on their insurance issues, whether it's advising on the purchase of policies or uh, often more critically on advising them on uh, claims and uh, lawsuits that may be covered by insurance. So I've, and, and most importantly here uh, for, ta for, t for today's panel, um, I work with clients on obtaining coverage to pay for trade secrets lawsuits. So at the outset, I think I shared the sentiment with our co-presenters that if if you all have questions along the way or things that um, you want to ask, please, please do so. I mean, we really want to make sure that we make this presentation useful and informative for all of you. So I know in the morning session we had a couple of questions there. We certainly would welcome them here as well and don't feel like you have to hold them all the way to the end. Um, so we've got a, three main areas we want to cover today's topic. Um, I'll speak to the first one here just kind of as a preview. We wanted to talk uh, a lot about sort of what type of trade secret issues may come up in the civil context, both from the context of movement of employees and employees either coming to a company or employees leaving a company and going to perhaps a competitor. What are some of the risks that arise from that? What are some of the very real life consequences that could arise if some of the best practices uh, in terms of protecting trade secrets or keeping yourself clean from another company's trade secrets aren't observed. I'll briefly touch upon actually a, a trial we had here in June uh, in Texas where it was a very real life example and certainly a very expensive exercise for our client having to defend against a trade secret case and actually had to counter sue uh, on a trade secret case as well, and this originally arose out of a, a, an employee moving to their company. Um, and just went up, let my co-presenters talk about what they're going to present at today's um, session as well. So I'll address uh, some of the um, recent uh, happenings in the, on the criminal side of trade secrets, which is kind of stepping back from it this morning, it occurred to me that it's, it's interesting uh, that in our country you can actually be imprisoned for taking information from one company to another. Uh, but that is in fact the case and there's been a lot of prosecutorial activity in the area of trade secrets in our district in the Northern District of California and throughout California. So I'll talk about some of those uh, cases and some of the lessons learned from those. Uh, we are lucky enough to be involved in many of the cases on the criminal side representing individuals and companies um, and advising companies on the victim side as well when they want to make a referral uh, to the criminal authorities. And so I'll talk a little bit about what happens when you do that and some of the pros and cons of doing that and what you can expect from that process. Um, and basically how the criminal um, framework overlays with the civil framework and some of the impacts, uh, Eugene and I will kind of discuss some of the impacts that a criminal case can have on a civil case and vice versa. And I will talk about, um, I'll focus on the expense of these trade secrets claims for defendants, uh, both the, for companies accused of trade secrets violations as well as uh, individual employees, executives uh, at a company. Um, this can be a considerable expense, but it's also one that uh, is often covered uh, by insurance. Um, and so 
you know, I view uh, insurance as a key asset uh, for the company um, w that has to deal with uh, a significant trade secrets claim. So we thought we would start off the session with a little bit of an interactive exercise with all of you. In the middle of your tables, there should be a hard copy that has a hypothetical for today's session. And much of what we're going to talk about will be shaped around this hypothetical situation. Uh, so I thought all of you could, could read along and get a sense of what example we're using. Probably you'll see parallels with situations you've either um, dealt with yourself or, or heard from other friends and colleagues of yours. I think for the video recording purposes, we'll read the hypothetical in just once um, so that they have that on the record. But please follow along on the hard copies. And then afterwards, we're going to do some voting. We're going to have a couple questions where we're going to ask you all to vote. So we have these clickers in the middle of the table, and I'll walk through that in a brief minute about how to use those. Uh, but for the hypothetical, hypothetical, there are two companies. One's called ScrapeX, and the other one's RakeBot. They're competing head-to-head -head for dominance in the data analytics space for marketing. Each company is rumored to be develop, developing a data scraping algorithm that may disrupt the industry. Four months ago, a top engineer left ScrapeX for RakeBot. ScrapeX performed a forensic analysis of that departing engineer's work laptop and learned that prior to the leaving, he had uploaded 1,500 files to a personal cloud storage account. Some of these files included the company's most sensitive trade secrets. ScrapeX's outside counsel sent a letter to the engineer demanding that he return the documents and threatening to bring suit. He responded that he thought that he could bring his work product with him, and then he did return the files. ScrapeX's counsel also sent a letter to RakeBot warning them not to accept or use any of ScrapeX's trade secrets. RakeBot responded that the engineer had not brought any trade secrets with him. Within a month of the engineer's departure, another four engineers from the same department also resigned from ScrapeX and moved to RakeBot to join their other engineer. And within a year of their departure, RakeBot debuts a new scraping technology that appears very similar to what ScrapeX had been working to achieve and what those engineers had been working on. So that's our hypothetical here. Um, so for our first polling question, if all of you have the clickers in front of you, if you guys can each pick up one. Um, and we're going to ask you to vote. We've got a couple questions here in a row that cover different aspects of this hypothetical. Uh, and as you can see, there are multiple choice. So for choice A, you just press number one on this clicker. And if you believe the answer to question one is choice B, I would ask you to click number two. Um, I'll tell you when to vote. We're going to have five seconds to get the voting in, and we'll get to see instant results. Um, so question one, again, just for uh, video purposes, it's, it's based on the facts of this hypothetical we just read. Does ScrapeX have a good faith basis to file a lawsuit against RakeBot? So everybody get ready to vote. And as soon as you see the countdown on the screen, please select either one or two. So here we go. Please get your votes in now. Our instant vote says overwhelmingly you all think there is a good faith basis for a lawsuit here. I think the facts you all find very compelling and apparently don't really believe the individuals when they said they returned everything and didn't use any of them. Uh, so we could talk a bit about what some of the potential causes of action that could arise from that set of facts. And it's actually probably more varied than we initially realized. There's a very obvious one up front, which is a potential trade secret misappropriation action. Um, Scrapex had identified in the files that had been stolen from them that there were company sensitive trade secrets. So certainly there is both a federal statute here, the Defend Trade Secret Act, and there's a state court cor uh, corollary in almost uh, every state of the country. Uh, there's also a very viable potential breach of employment contract action against the engineer who left. Almost every engineer's contract is going to require them to preserve the confidentiality of the information that they had at ScrapeX um, by taking it to um, the other company, RakeBot, and by all appearances, looking like he's used it to develop a competing product 
there looks to be at least one type of breach of his employment contract. As uh, you all probably picked up by uploading 1,500 files to his own personal cloud storage account, uh, there could be an argument that he's violated the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Essentially, he had exceeded what he was authorized to do, um, or maybe he was not authorized at all to take those files with him. And in doing so, that may have created a claim against him. Uh, if you truly dive into that statute, it becomes a lot more nuanced of analysis, but certainly it's on the table when you first look at uh, what potential suits there are. It may surprise some of you, but there could be potentially a RICO claim. And of course, this has overlaps with the criminal area that, that Jess is an expert in. Uh, but there could be allegations that this has actually been a conspiracy over time. Uh, and for example, if you remember in the hypothetical, additional engineers moved over um, and they were originally all from the same department. And so that can create a concern or an appearance that this was actually some type of enterprise that was created and that it lasted over a period of time and that the entire purpose of the enterprise was to steal uh, technology and bring it over to create a competing product. So that can be somewhat surprising to people in a room that you could actually have a civil RICO action between two companies um, just based on movement of employees creating uh, potential, uh, potential RICO liability. Um, unfair competition uh, is available in just about every state, and given that these two companies are competitors, uh, a basis of it being the activity of potentially stealing trade secrets to create a competing product, uh, that's also another available cause of action, and then certainly in just enrichment as, as a damages theory, um, as well as just sort of common law conspiracy. Uh, at this point, you know, oftentimes client will ask, uh, in addition to civil causes of action, what type of um, law enforcement options may be available? And just I think the next polling question probably tees up a good discussion, but certainly many clients seem to ask, should I be considering law enforcement possibility as well with an example like this? Sure, so uh, let's see here to the next polling. This is a little more tricky than the last one, um, but if you did want to, if ScrapeX does want to go to the government and make a report to law enforcement, who do you think they would go to? Uh, so if you think it's the U.S. Attorney's Office, click one. If you think it's the FBI, click two. And if you think it would be the, the District Attorney's Office for the county in which the conduct occurred, press three. All right, actually, uh, we, the majority did get it right, which is that the FBI is the first uh, line of defense for reports of federal criminal activity. Um, they obviously are the investigators on the ground. Um, although I think A is actually uh, not a bad option either if you have the right counsel. Um, I've certainly made direct uh, reports to the U.S. Attorney's Office of Crimes, and usually they refer me back to the FBI, uh, but it's not a bad thing to have the prosecutors aware of uh, the issues that you're reporting so that they can kind of keep on the FBI and make sure that, uh, that investigations are proceeding apace. Um, obviously, the FBI has, uh, you know, hundreds if not thousands of reports of criminal activity happening um, quarterly, so they really do get, it's a resourcing issue. Um, I've been lucky enough in a couple of situations where I've uh, referred it to the FBI to have a U.S. attorney assigned pretty quickly, and that's in some of the more egregious cases where you come with, you know, really strong evidence of a crime having occurred. You'll get a lot more traction quickly uh, versus kind of a more, a relatively vague claim or maybe that something happened. Um, that will take a lot more time, and it's, uh, I think we're all influenced by television and movies uh, to believe that you just, you know, you drop the dime and the FBI flies into, uh, into action and goes and, and it executes search warrants and puts people in handcuffs right away, and that's really not, not how it works. It takes a, quite a long time for the government to uh, mobilize its resources and to affect the criminal process that's required uh, in these cases to get warrants and uh, to do all kinds and subpoenas and that sort of thing. It's, it's much, much slower than people expect. So let's see here. 
So, all right, now we're gonna talk a little bit about um, on the insurance side, and then we'll kind of circle back around and talk about how these things all overlap with each other. Yes, uh, by the way, uh, these, these questions keep getting increasingly harder. Eugene started <laughs> with the softball. Um, my question for the group is, what type of insurance policy is most likely to provide coverage to Rakebot against this uh, lawsuit by Scrapex? And you have uh, the four choices listed below. You have to click it again, I guess, to make the countdown. Okay. Oh. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so this was a tricky one. The, the correct answer is A, actually. It's the director's and officer's policy. Um, uh, Directors and officers' policies are often called management liability policies as well, um, and you know uh, they are the most uh, most common source of coverage for trade secrets cases. And there's still a possibility of coverage under other types of policies. It, it does depend on the policy language, but uh, the DNO policy is the first place to look. Um, and the reason why is it's uh, it they tend to broadly cover claims against. Uh, individual uh, executives. Oftentimes, it's not just um, who you think of as you know the board of directors and the the uh, the C-suite officers. Um, oftentimes, these DNO policies will cover uh, employees broadly. So, if you have a lawsuit, uh, say, uh, for example, starting with a civil lawsuit where uh, the plaintiff um, Scrapex has asserted claims both against Rakex, the company, as, as well as um, the five engineers um, who um, appear to have made off with files, trade secrets of the company, um, then the defense of those five individuals, the five engineers, uh, would typically be covered under uh, a DNO policy, certainly under, um, certainly if uh, Rake, Rakebot is a private company um, uh, where the uh, directors and officers policies issued to private companies tend to be broader. Uh, but even in some cases for if Rakebot was um, a public company, um, in both instances you may have coverage for the defense of those um, uh, individual engineers. And while that won't get you coverage for the entire lawsuit, um, it can get you coverage for most of that lawsuit. Um, you've got, you know, if, if you look at a case, it, depending on the facts of the matter, perhaps it's, you know, one particular in individual or two um, that present the uh, greatest risk uh, on, uh, under Scrapex's lawsuit. Um, so there may be arguments that, that those people's defense require the most effort um, and, you know, the um, defense of the company, by contrast, is really just sort of a follow-on to the, to the work that's already being done and has to be done for the, the individuals most, uh, most at risk. Um, so, um, it's, so it is the DNO policy that provides that coverage. Um, uh, like I said, it's typically for claims against the individuals less common, uh, in, in less common scenarios, it, it also provides coverage for the company, um, and that would be uh, for the defense of the case. It would be whether the case is civil or criminal, because you certainly can have both. Uh, sometimes uh, the civil coming first, sometimes the criminal coming first. Um, and um, so you've got that coverage for defense. You, that coverage can also be available to settle uh, the civil lawsuit. Uh, obviously, the civil lawsuit will uh, be seeking damages, and you can um, utilize your uh, insurance policy to help pay for most, if not all, of that settlement. So it's really important for a company uh, like Rakebot, uh, you know, when you get hit with a lawsuit, trade secrets lawsuit, obviously the first thing you think, start thinking about is how do we defend this case? Um, but I would say uh, uh, immediately thereafter, you should also be thinking about your insurance uh, and what policies cover it. Look to your DNO policy, look at your other policies as well. 
uh, because that can be an important asset um, to the company in um, uh, dealing with the substantial expense of defending these cases. And uh, Eugene, um, can you comment on the strategy that you would consider in uh, considering an affirmative trade secrets case? Are you thinking about whether or not you want your defendant to be able to access the DNO? What kind of cases, you know, what kind of um, uh, sort of considerations go into that? Because I can certainly comment about it on the on the criminal side, but I'm interested in your thoughts. Yeah, and I, I think this very much depends on the client's actual situation in the marketplace uh, and where they feel their competitor sits vis-a-vis -vis against them. So if you add into this hypothetical that, uh, let's say, Scrapex is the predominant company in this, in this field uh, and their rake bot is not yet a known commodity, but you're worried that their competing product is going to come in and steal customers and market share, uh, very likely the conversation with Scrapex, if that's your client, is going to be that you're looking for quick injunctive relief. Uh, it's not going to be about monetary damages. You're really trying to stop them from getting that product on the marketplace and gaining any traction. Uh, and that probably counsels towards moving very quickly, maybe potentially getting a restraining order if there's enough evidence forensically, uh, followed by a very quick preliminary injunction. And we're talking about a period of maybe one month from when you file your complaint till having your injunction hearing, and whatever, whatever evidence you're gonna gather from a civil context is gonna have to happen in that compressed period. Um, so a lot of homework has to be done up front, and you have a short time period where the court will permit you to go get some evidence to prove up your injunction. Um, however, very often as these cases move, people evolve in what they think their primary interest is, or there is also a sentiment sometimes the cat is already out of the bag. There are, there are perhaps multiple competitors in the same space, and what someone's more interested in is, is monetary damages, being compensated for the value of the trade secrets that have been taken, perhaps the saved research and development that your competitor got by stealing um, a so-called head start, so to speak, in terms of in being able to propel their competing product out in the marketplace. And I think from that perspective, you often do uh, then wonder about the resources that your, your opponent has. Um, and will they be able to pay if they're a small startup, for example? And then information about whether they have insurance, whether they're covered um, as, as part of your discovery uh, into that could actually influence and impact your decision making on that front. Um, but Jess, I'm always curious from if you're, let's say you're helping the engineer in this instance, um, or RakeBot, right? What, what would you, if they were really worried about a criminal proceeding potentially coming down, what would you advise them to do? Sure. So, you know, the DNO is is the best friend of the criminal defense attorney, honestly. It's, um, when I'm advising on the victim side, I'm often, uh, you know, saying, well, we don't know, you know, in the, in the period of time in which these decisions have to be made, as Eugene alluded to, it's often a very compressed time frame. We don't know. We don't have access to the policies on the other side, but certainly we can expect, and as Ray can comment, that there, you know, DNO usually has some pretty standard terms, and the uh, naming of individuals is often the talisman that opens up the coverage. And so, um, you know, although it's obviously not a great thing for the individual to be named in a civil case individually or to have a criminal investigation open, as soon as we get the first DOJ subpoena, as soon as we get the first call from law enforcement, the, um, the funds open up. <laughs> and, and that can really be uh, the lifesaver for, uh, for a defense, um, although obviously eventually uh, you, know, you run into policy limit issues and you run into uh, whether or not, you know, whether what the GNO actually covers and whether it's a private or public company, which of course is much more a raised area. Um, but certainly uh, it's kind of a please don't name individuals. You know, you really actually do want um, some uh, trigger because that will help to make sure that the people involved can be adequately protected in the process. Um, people who are unrepresented when the FBI comes to their door often will give all kinds of statements that they later regret. Uh, but people who can quickly kind of counsel up in these situations can really help to protect the company's interest and the individual's interest as well. Hey, Jess, could I ask you, to, oh, sorry, go ahead. 
Question. So, what about, what's the impact of intentional wrongdoing here? Does GNO cover all exposure regardless of intentionality? Well, yeah, <laughs> good question. So, the a DNO policy uh, may have, will typically have uh, an exclusion for some kind of uh, uh, intentional misconduct or uh, criminal misconduct. Um, the wording varies, but in most instances, um, the DNO policy still covers the individuals until there is a uh, final adjudication that they were, you know, that they were. Uh, engaged in uh, intentional misconduct or, or whatever the phrase is in that exclusion language. So you would have a defense throughout the case and then the question at the back end, uh, if you get to a final judgment in the criminal case or in the civil case um, is, well, is the exclusion triggered at that point in time? Thank you. Yes, that's right. So Jess, what I was going to ask is, in the civil context, we've talked about both whether you get injunctive relief or monetary damages, but inevitably when you get into a discussion with your client about should I pursue getting law enforcement help, what are the sort of the pros and cons of that analysis if you're the one who's looking to enforce your trade secrets? Sure. So if you have really uh, definitive um, evidence of criminal conduct, intentionality, um, if you've somehow cottoned on to, in particular, a foreign government um, or foreign company being involved, and you think you're going to be able to get the attention of the feds, um, you know that would be the point in which uh, it might be a good idea to try to trigger that resource because they can. They obviously do have um, abilities beyond the civil in terms of coming in and executing search warrants and seizing. Uh, electronic devices which may have evidence of crime on it or um, even, um, you know, arresting people in the most egregious cases. And once that, uh, those resources are brought to bear, it will really change the dynamic of the case. And if the feds are investigating a crime or they've brought an indictment, it's certainly going to help with, um, on the plaintiff's side, <laughs> to establish liability or to try to drive a settlement, a monetary settlement. Um, on the other hand, it certainly changes the tenor of the case in a way that you kind of, as a plaintiff, lose a lot of control over what's going to happen with the case. And certainly my experience has been that once there's a federal criminal investigation open, the individuals and the company really lock down um, and stop participating in civil discovery as, as much as possible, take the Fifth Amendment, invoke the Fifth Amendment in discovery, although we can talk a little more about the impact of that on the civil side. But it, it um, you know, when somebody's freedom is on the line and their back's against the wall, assuming they have good DNO coverage that affords them uh, competent counsel, they're going to be fighting for their lives and they're not going to be um, as amenable perhaps to a, a negotiated settlement or an admission of any liability. Um, it really sort of changes things and you don't have control at that point about what happens. The government has got that control. And so you obviously want to have a great relationship with the prosecutors and the agents that are on the case, but you, you don't get to decide. You get consulted as a victim on plea deals, plea offers that are being made and on the status of the case, but ultimately it's not up to you anymore. So that's kind of the risk. You know, you can tap into a really um, helpful resource in some cases, especially if it's, you know, matters that you don't believe you're going to be able to uncover through civil discovery. If somebody's taken electronic devices to another country or is about to flee, is, you know, on their way to the airport to get on a flight to China, the only way to stop that is the FBI. Um, but if you, you know, short of that and short of having really great facts that are compelling enough to cause the government to act, uh, you may kind of have opened a Pandora's box, have provided DNO coverage to the other side that they are going to use to fight you and shut it down and the Fifth Amendment's going to be a big barrier to your ability to uncover the information in the civil side. And Eugene, do you want to comment on that? What, you know, what have you experienced in terms of, because you've worked on some of these cases that have a criminal aspect, um, what is what happens when 
somebody is accused of a crime and they don't, they're not answering civil uh, discovery, refusing to testify. Yeah, that certainly becomes obviously a very challenging situation for, for your civil case, but specifically if you've got your key employee, um, let's say you're on the enforcing side and, and you've, you've named as engineers one of your defendants and he or she's been counseled to take the Fifth Amendment uh, so that when he takes the stand, either in his deposition or at trial, he is invoking the protections of the Fifth Amendment and not answering some of the most difficult questions, but the questions that you would think would be most illuminating to the jury or the judge as to what actually happened. Um, one of your um, outlets is, is actually to seek an adverse inference at trial. Um, and this we actually saw most recently, not for me personally, but in the Waymo and Uber litigation, where, as many of you who've seen it in the press, um, the main engineer, a gentleman named Anthony Lewandowski, um, did indeed take the Fifth Amendment uh, during the proceedings. And very much so, then Waymo, Waymo asked for an adverse inference, inference from the court. And that meant that there would be a jury instruction telling the jury to infer that indeed he had done the misdeeds he'd been accused of for each of the questions he was refusing the answer. Um, that can be obviously detrimental to one side of the case. Mm -hmm. um, but from a civil litigant's perspective, if you're the one who's enforcing, that's a great instruction to be able to get. Uh, it's uh, not automatic. You do have to ask the court for it, and there's some standards you have to go through. Um, but the more the issue I'd say if the question is close to the core issue of the case, indeed, if you're asking him, did you take these particular files, um, or did you use these particular files at your new job, and he's invoking the Fifth Amendment, uh, you have a great chance with the court that if he invokes the Fifth, you can get an adverse instruction um, to the jury on that front. So from civil litigant perspective on the enforcing side, that's great. If you're on the defending perspective, it's a very, very um, tough balancing act. Uh, having gone through a trial in Texas where we had an engineer and a startup company accused of, of stealing trade secrets, you have to take a long and hard look about what is your actual story you're telling the jury. Um, what is actually what happened there and who came up with the trade secrets? So it can be a calculus where you say there is some risk about some exposure because perhaps there is some unclean forensic activity. person may have either intentionally or inadvertently taken some files they thought truly was their own work product. But you may decide from a civil perspective, you need that individual to tell their story. They have to get up there, look the jury in the eye and say, these were my creations. I actually created these before I got to my first employer. Um, these were my inventions. I actually kept them on my own. Uh, and be prepared to explain that story, that evolution of his inventions and how he took that to his new company. Because um, if you don't have that witness, that engineer explaining that, you really don't have another witness who can do it. Um, you, you can't get that same effect from having an expert witness take the stand and try to supply a story from a, an objective perspective, so to speak. Um, but it does create risk. You know, the person will be exposed to cross-examination about some of the facts that could then potentially be used, I think, later on in, in a, a criminal action should the, should the government be taking a look. I think. Absolutely right. And I think it's, it's especially fraught on the criminal side if there is a criminal investigation pending, especially if the person's been uh, identified as a subject or target of that investigation. Certainly as a criminal defense practitioner, my knee jerk is always take five. <laughs> What's, why would you, you know, why would you risk your freedom for the outcome of a civil case in favor of your employer who may or may not stand with you uh, throughout the case? Um, so it is generally kind of the practice uh, to take, a, you know, invoke the Fifth Amendment broadly in civil discovery if there is a, um, a pending criminal investigation, even if the questions are not necessarily directed to that particular conduct. I've tried to do it where you slice and dice because of the negative inference problem where we sort of say, okay, we're gonna answer half the questions and not the other half. Uh, but you can also make an argument that you would answer none. You would say, you know, what's your name, where do you live, and that's it. And the rest is uh, on the advice of counsel, I invoke my Fifth Amendment, respect the rights and respectfully decline to answer. And that's the remainder of it. Um, so it is a very difficult situation for someone to be put in. On the other hand, if 
there's an uh, early determination made that the, the criminal defense case is defensible, um, that you actually have an exculpatory story and you think that you're going to need to kind of go all in, shoot for the moon, um, as it were, in the criminal case and uh, attest your innocence throughout, then sometimes it does make sense to um, waive your Fifth Amendment rights in at least you know one or two proceedings, and you can always you know you can always come back around to it. Although it's a little harder to invoke your Fifth Amendment rights if you've given a lot of information that can be used against you. Um, but if you think your witness is going to your client's going to stand up and uh, and it's going to be believable in um, in defending their innocence, then Sometimes the calculus, um, as Eugene has said, is that they should go ahead and testify and give their story, but there's always the risk, very strong risk, that the government later will say either that they don't believe the story or that it was a lie um, or that what you've proffered to the government separately is not true, that there might be some inconsistency between what you've testified to and what you've told them, which could open you up to liability on different federal statutes, including 18 U.S.C. 1001. So there are a lot of traps for the unwary. It's a very, very difficult situation for an individual to be in, no question about it. And we've completely stopped our slides, so sorry about that. Um, so. Uh before I jump into the slide, what I was, the last comment I was going to have on, on the Fifth Amendment and Lewandowski situation is you see in, in his case, the balancing really had come out to play. Uh, the civil case went first between Waymo and Uber. And for those of you, if you weren't familiar, it's technology that underlies the self-driving car um, pieces, in particular to a piece of technology known as LiDAR. And Anthony Lewandowski was seen as in, in the industry as a preeminent expert. Uh, in that space, and he was heavily recruited from Waymo to go to Uber. So in that civil trial um, where he was a defendant along with Uber, he took the fifth, and that case ultimately settled during trial. Um, and depending on which version of the press he read, either a very favorable settlement for Waymo or one, uh, anyways, it was supposedly a, they've taken some sort of stock valued at nine digits in, in Uber. So a substantial settlement. Uh, and that was a calculated move to, to protect Lewandowski, but it led to a big settlement. That case ended, but now a criminal case has been opened against him. And so by taking the fifth, he at least has prevented certain answers from being in the record, being in evidence. Um, and he, I think through his counsel, probably had a sense that there might have been a criminal proceeding that would come subsequently. So their calculus very much was to protect himself and whatever sort of penalty comes on the civil side, and ultimately they settled for a substantial amount, they were going to take that. Yeah, the Lewandowski indictment issued in the summer, and it's uh, usually there's at least a you know three to six month, sometimes a lot longer lag time between the beginning of the criminal investigation and the issuance of the indictment. So uh, I'm sure Judge Alsip's comments in the civil case in inviting or actually ordering the uh, criminal authorities to investigate probably was a tip off. Uh, but I think um, given where it's now, the state of the case now, I'm sure his counsel and he are pleased that they did not decide to take the risk and testify uh, because as cases unfold, you never know what you're going to, what your defense is going to evolve to be necessarily and it's good to be able to be nimble about it. If you make a statement, you're locked into it for all, all time. All right, let's yeah. talk about CNEX. So what I wanted to quickly illustrate is while we started this was a hypothetical, uh, just to point out how real life this can be. Uh, so in a case that I tried with several of my colleagues here in June in Texas, um, it was at the core of it, it began as a situation where an employee left Huawei uh, and moved to be uh, one of the co-founders at a startup known as CNEX Labs. Um, and CNEX was in the space of developing specialized microprocessors, chips, uh, to be placed in storage devices that are put in massive data centers. Uh, data centers owned by people like a Microsoft or a Google or an Amazon. Um, and you take a situation where this wouldn't be that, all that uncommon, but they, you know, you end up finding yourself in a case where they plot together a bunch of circumstantial facts and all of a sudden you have a very expensive case to defend because perhaps at the outset you didn't take some of the best practices to, to protect yourself. 
So just a small glimpse into what this case looked like. We literally had a proceeding here where this is one of the slides they use, Huawei used in the opening statement uh, in their trial against our client. And they pointed out that this key engineer, uh, a gentleman named Ronnie Huang, left Huawei on, on May 31st, 2013, that he co-founded his new business uh, a mere three days later uh, in the same technology space that he was working on at Huawei. And they pointed that out just less than a month later, he filed his very first patent application. And so their argument, just from that calendar alone, would be the obvious one as you all sit here and think about it is, well, what else could he have done in those 20 days but use and steal the information he had been working on in his prior job and start filing some new patents on them and claim that they belong to his new startup? So of course, lo and behold, they put up another slide and they said, you also brought some colleagues over. In this case, they said there's 24 people who came over. So that's a big conspiracy you're doing. It went into all your patents because you kept filing a bunch of them out there um, right away after you left our, uh, our company. And then they said, well, all this startup money you're getting, all these investors who are giving you money is based on your technology. That's what they're investing in. And we believe it's stolen. So every dime you've gotten from the investors belongs to us. So that was Huawei's argument. Um, the microcosm of just a situation of really a gentleman who moved. Yes, he moved quickly, started up a new business with some partners. And it started from him having to file patents quickly within the first month. Um, fortunately, in that situation, we were able to prevail. We actually put that engineer up on the stand and he had to explain for himself what he had done. Um, and fortunately for our client, he had a very true and believable story about actually how all of these inventions stem back to his earlier decades of work and were actually different from what he had done at Huawei. But a very expensive exercise nonetheless for a startup client. Um, and merely because really at the outset they were moving very quickly. Um, certainly nobody's looking at a calendar to say you have to slow your patent drafting down. Uh, but there were certainly things they could have done to make their documents look cleaner, make their forensics look cleaner, um, and hopefully have to avoid a multi-million dollar lawsuit in the middle of your um, startup campaign. So here we are going to shift a little bit into some of the best practices that I've been referencing, um, things that can help either your clients or your own companies in terms of uh, being a little bit cleaner on, on trade secrets, both protecting them or if you fear that they're um, going to be lost with departing employees. So here I'm going to ask a question at this outset of whether either of you work for an organization or if you're an outside lawyer, whether your clients typically ask um, when they're onboarding employees about their prior employment contracts, uh, ask to actually see a copy of it. So uh, if you can lock in your votes here, that'd be great. So. Uh, unsurprisingly, that is often the answer we get, is people don't. Uh, they actually don't ask about it. And in, in the case we tried in June, June, that was true as well. They followed sort of what the trend was and, and did not ask, uh, out of just sort of not wanting to invade what they thought might be private information of another business. However, actually one of the best practices would be to ask your engineers um, about at least what their obligations were, what they understand their obligations to be from their prior jobs, right? Do they have ongoing obligations about not to disclose confidential information? Do they have ongoing obligations about not to solicit other employees um, from their companies? Now, obviously in California, that has become a question about whether that remains enforceable, but if you look at a situation, if they come from out of state, for example, they've moved to California from a job in, say, Maryland, uh, it can be a very different situation there. So you do have to ask to see what the employee understands their prior obligations to be. Um, they may indeed have been a shareholder at their prior business. It might have been a small company, they were a shareholder, and they could be subject to non-compete obligations as a result of that. Um, you need to know as a new employee, as a new employer, what this uh, employee is bringing in the door, what his obligations are, um, and actually oftentimes there are employers who will be willing to share their prior agreements with the new employee, just with the new employment um, company, so that there is a clear understanding about these carrying over obligations. 
Uh, so just a few other best practices here, and then again, I'm happy to talk about them afterwards too. Uh, but it starts first with the contract side. So for incoming employees, one of the obvious clauses, uh, but one that has very real life implications, is a clause in your employment contract where you require each of your employees to literally certify they're not bringing in any confidential information from their prior employment company, and that that is a condition of their employment. They're not bringing anything in from their prior business, and they're not gonna be relying. Uh, they'll actually affirmatively state that in their contract. They're not relying on any confidential information from their prior company. Um, and so in that trial we had in June, we very much used these employment contracts to defend our client. We showed the jury, we showed the judge these clauses and said, this is very much the intention of our business. We tried every day to practice this and we would ask everybody to sign these agreements and abide by them. Um, and so you use them. So you certainly want to have those provisions in your contract in case you unfortunately find yourself in a day where you have to defend yourself, you want to be able to refer back and show you've had these practices and intent all along from the time you actually um, hired these individuals. For your current employees, some companies as a best practice ask their employees to recertify every year. Um, and in fact, the way they incentivize people to recertify every year that they're not using confidential information from a prior job is uh, they'll actually shut off your access to the share spaces at your company. So you can't access your, your SharePoint, you can't access the company Trello accounts, you can't access Zapier until you have actually recertified and then you'll be granted back your access to all the information. Uh, but that continues sort of a, a healthy sort of best practice. You're asking all your employees to continually certify that they are not using confidential information from before. Uh, on a recruiting front, this goes towards sort of a, a non-solicit non issue. Generally, you want to uh, separate your engineers from the people who actually do all the HR work. Um, engineers are usually the ones who are going to be subject to your non-solicit provisions or also high-value sales and marketing people. Um, but certainly, you want someone to do all the background checking we're talking about, what are their obligations. Um, from their prior company through someone who actually has an HR hat and not just your CTO or your head of engineering who says, right, 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 I checked all those boxes, they're here. Um, so just having that additional level of separation sometimes ensures that the questions do get asked. Um, there's a huge issue these days with employee mobility around mobile devices as well as cloud storage. Um, this is always a cost-benefit analysis, but for individuals who are, you know are worth a lot, they either bring a wealth of technical and for knowledge like, like an Anthony Lewandowski, um, or potentially a sales individual who brings you know, a, a lot of value because they can bring a lot of business to your company, it may be worth it before the individual arrives that they agree to do, uh, have their devices have a forensic analysis to ensure that they aren't bringing any confidential information or even emails uh, or access to share sites from their prior employer. And to have that done through a third party before they start your job at your new, uh, at your current company. Um, get them a new iCloud account, they use iCloud. Uh, even if they've told you I have wiped everything or I have unlinked it, we've had situations where clients said they, their employees said that, it turns out when they reset up their phone, uh, it automatically synced back to their old iCloud without them being aware. Next thing you know, they actually continue, quote unquote, to have access to documents that on an iCloud account they thought they had unlinked. Um, you get into an argument about whether you used it or not, but it just adds more to the atmospherics. So like the calendar I was showing you earlier at that trial, people just start adding little bits and bits of inferential evidence uh, that makes it harder and harder for you to defend. That's right, and if you're in a criminal case arguing about whether you used the information or not, you're already really I'm not in a good position. And that, you know, that also alludes to the issue of the uh, BYOD uh, struggle that many companies are going through right now about whether or not to fund um, people's mobile devices or provide company-owned mobile devices. And certainly, the more you do fund or provide your own clean company device, the more access and control you're going to be able to have over the contents of it uh, versus letting somebody have their own iPhone that they might have had you know, from other employers, your ability to access data on there and make sure that it doesn't contain anything problematic becomes a lot more constrained. Uh, and the 
your com compliance policies around that are going to be key if you ever do need to uh, require someone to provide it to you to take a look at. Uh, and the last point that I couldn't emphasize enough, I know it's a cost and a burden for people, but training is, is really important. The obvious times are people remember to train or when somebody onboards and when somebody leaves, you kind of go through a checklist and remind them of their obligations. But another great time to do it actually is if someone gets promoted or during their review. Um, when someone gets promoted, they're happy, they know they're assuming new responsibilities, that's actually a great time for them to even just do a re quick online quiz at the company to kind of refresh on their obligations. Um, there are literally clients who do little comic strips and ask people to take a look at the comic strips, identify risks that are being done. It might be a comic strip of a whiteboard session with a potential client. Um, just having them go through that exercise for 10, 15 minutes and identifying some of the risks, um, they're much more liable to do it when they're, when they're getting promoted. They'll, they'll finish doing that. Um, or at times when they're getting their reviews, uh, understanding that they need to do well in time for their review, they will actually participate and, and finish these little uh, training quizzes. So those are also great times just to remind everybody at the company about um, how to behave and follow best practices. And that uh, that's also really comes into play when you're trying to defend either a civil case or a criminal case, to have the in affected individuals to be able to say, yes, I was told, yes, this is the standard training, yes, everyone knows that. Uh, so in the event that one person in the company doesn't follow that, it becomes an individual issue and not a company issue. And that just is just a much better place to be when you're trying to defend, especially a criminal uh, case. Although it's rare these days for a corporation to be charged criminally, it's not impossible. And it certainly impacts your standing uh, with the government if you're able to say, look, we have adequate compliance policies and somebody violated it and we're you know, doing everything we can to ensure that it doesn't happen again. And I think we're coming down to the wire on time, so we probably want to speed up a little bit. Yeah, so I'll go through these pretty quick. Um, theft of trade secrets is the you know main uh, criminal statute that applies here. Um, the defendant has to be aware of what they're doing. There's a mens rea requirement that they knew that the information was proprietary and that it had an uh, independent economic value. Um, that it can't just be kind of uh, you know um, every every shred of information that's ever uh, been issued from the company. However. I will say, based on experience, that um, it's not it's not really as uh, clean as it seems like it should be under the statute. And again, if you're in a situation of trying to defend a case by arguing that something is not a trade secret and it doesn't have economic value, uh, depending on the other circumstances in the case, you're going to be in a, in a much tougher situation. Um, and then economic espionage, which is the more uh, severe of the criminal statutes that can apply, Im impacts uh, cases in which there is a foreign government or foreign instrumentality involved. And with some of the countries uh, in the world that we do business with, especially in the Pacific Rim, there's a lot of government activity, a lot of government um, involvement in private industry which makes this a relatively low bar to um, overcome. And it certainly has been a major uh, enforcement priority for our government, given the, um, you know, all the, the trade fight with China uh, currently happening, that there is a, a real effort underway to root out uh, this uh, perception anyway that, there, uh, that our valuable American IP is being siphoned off overseas. So that is, um, that's where you're gonna see a lot of government resources being applied to try to prevent that and, and deter that and to get extract fines from companies that need to and want to continue to do business within the US, which is almost all of them. <laughs> Uh, that that is, uh, that's an area where if you want to get government scrutiny on your trade secrets case, if you can show some kind of element of foreign involvement, um, like Huawei is a major uh, defendant right now in, a, in ongoing trade secrets cases. Uh, so these cases are on the rise, as I mentioned, in our district especially. Um, uh, Dave Anderson, our new U.S. attorney in the Northern District, as of earlier this year, commented in June that um, his office is constantly being asked to prosecute alleged trade secrets theft. So everybody in the office, 135 U assistant U.S. attorneys could be doing nothing but that. 
Um, of course, that's not what they're doing, so you can imagine there is a winnowing process, uh, but it is very, a uh, very significant part of, um, of what they are focused on in our district. Uh, as you could imagine, we have a lot of innovation and a lot of IP happening in Silicon Valley, a lot of money associated with that, so uh, there's a whole lot of these cases that are pending. Um, and then um, I alluded before to what does it take to get the feds to um, investigate your case. Uh, the, the U.S. Attorney's Manual lays out some factors, and these slides, by the way, I know I'm going through it terribly fast, but you can uh, get, the, get the materials easily. I think they're going to be available on a link if they haven't already. Um, they are going to evaluate, you know, what is the, how, how uh, compelling is the evidence? Again, is there a foreign government involved? Um, what kind of injury has this caused uh, to the trade secret owner? Um, and what is, what is the deterrent effect if they go after this particular case. Recent cases that we've talked about include the Lewandowski case, the Huawei case that I just alluded to, um, US v. Chen, another self-driving car uh, case, um, UMC, US v. UMC, which is my, one of my cases, um, US v. Zhang, uh, involving, again, self-driving cars, um, and U.S. v. Liu, which was uh, a trial in our district several years ago. Again, it was, a, I think, a debatable issue about whether the, the items at issue were trade secrets, but the, the company that had been um, the trade secret holder was DuPont, a very large American company, very well resourced, and Mr. Liu is currently sending, is spending uh, 15 years in uh, as a guest of the federal government. Um, so I think... We, uh, we can go through this really quick because we're actually at time, but um, what do you do if you think that your trade secrets have been stolen? Obviously, you want to make sure that uh, whoever the individual, impacted individual is, is not able to access the information anymore. Um, you want to consult with competent counsel, both on the coverage side and potentially on the criminal side. Um, if somebody uh, in your company has been accused of trade secrets theft, especially if it's a criminal investigation, uh, you do want to counsel up very quickly for all the reasons we've talked about, especially if there's a search warrant um, being issued or you're aware of one being um, executed in your company, that's a really big tip off. Probably want to do an internal investigation to get to the bottom of it to understand where things went wrong and how this happened. And again, getting individual counsel early for the individual is a big help. So I'll just kind of go through this quickly and let Ray close out for the last couple of minutes on. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I've already really covered, covered it, yeah. uh, what I was gonna say uh, in the course of this presentation. Um, I, I would only emphasize that, yes, if, if, if you're a company and you receive a, a, a trade secrets uh, lawsuit or an uh, inquiry from the DOJ, um, uh, you know, you should um, think about obviously defending, how, how are you gonna defend that case, but almost immediately thereafter or simultaneous if possible, think about your insurance, provide notice to your insurers, um, uh, as that will be an important component of, of uh, dealing with the expense of uh, these trade secrets claims. And uh, are there any questions? I know we went really fast there at the end and we're obviously happy to take questions up here as well. All right, well thank you so much for joining us today and it's obviously a really interesting topic. So uh, we look forward to chatting with you all about it uh, later on, thank you.